Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and has ever wondered about them. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and its sequels, and the Top Secret Diary of Celie Valentine series. And I'm Eve Yohalem. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related question. In this episode, we explore what makes a book a bestseller. This is a question that we as authors obsess about, right? Oh, absolutely. But it's also a question that as a reader we spend, or at least I spend a lot of time thinking about, I mean, what makes a book a bestseller? Why do we always see the same names on the bestseller lists? What goes into those decisions and those sales? Do you remember how we decided we wanted to do an episode about this? I can't remember how it started. I think it's because I'm a little bit obsessed with a series of blog posts and newsletters that I read, I think it was like five years ago, but I still remember them so clearly, from an author named Miranda Beverly Whitmore and a marketing expert named Dan Blank. Miranda had had a couple of books out and they hadn't sold well. And she was just very transparent about how book number three was it for her. Like either this book did well or everything was over. She was toast as a writer. And and you got to see from moment one, sort of all of the things that she was trying to think about and all the steps she was trying to take to get herself on the bestseller list. And I just loved knowing about that process. And then in her case, seeing it work. Yeah. The happy ending made it even better. It worked out. And so I thought, let's try to interview Miranda and Dan. And we did. Yes. And we did. (laughs) Yeah. It's so exciting. So we have lots of interesting insights to share with everyone today. Let's start with Miranda. Uh, Miranda Beverly Whitmore is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Bittersweet, which is the book she was working on in that whole blog series. She also wrote Set Me Free, which won the Janet Heidegger Kafka Prize, which is given annually to the best book of fiction by an American woman and two other novels, June and The Effects of Light. She's a recipient of the Crazy Horse Prize in Fiction, and she lives and writes in Brooklyn. And Dan Blank is the founder of We Grow Media, where he helps writers develop a human-centered approach to marketing and reaching their audience. He's the author of the book Be the Gateway, a practical guide to sharing your creative work and engaging an audience. He's worked with thousands of writers and many amazing organizations who support creative people like Penguin Random House, Sesame Workshop, Hachette Book Group, the list goes on and on. I also just want to say that I have taken courses with Dan and worked with him on various things, and he's both a tremendous help and a good friend. And I want to second that because I've also been working with Dan on Blue and he, he's been absolutely wonderful. And they're not the only ones we interviewed for this episode. The second part of this episode is really fascinating. We interviewed Matthew Jockers, who is the co-inventor of something called the bestseller ometer. And I'm just going to leave that hanging out there so everyone can wonder <laughs> about it. But we will answer your questions in the second half of the episode, I promise. Yes. But we started with Dan and Miranda. So how did the the experience with the disappointing sales, how did that affect your writing afterwards? At first, I tried to hustle and stay very positive. I tried to sell the book I'd written in college. I tried to sell a pitch of a second book. And then I wrote a whole book and I tried to sell that. And none of those would sell. And so then I was also really happily married. And I said, okay, I'm going to have a baby, (laughs) (laughs) which wasn't super easy either, but I had a baby and that was really wonderful for a while. And then I started to feel this kind of panic of having had what seemed like this really flourishing, promising career, and then kind of becoming this other version of myself Mm -hmm. and wanting to get back to the work and realized, oh, what I really want to do is I want to write, but also if I'm writing something, I'd like for it to sell because I have a kid now that I'm supporting and I live in New York and it's expensive and my husband is a massage therapist and we would like to be able to pay our rent. I thought consciously I want to write another book, but I'd like for it to, I'd like any control I have over about its sales, I'd like to make them before I write the book. So I'm going to kind of think thoughtfully about the kind of books I like to read when I'm on vacation as a someone who loves language and who loves plot 
I'm going to think about what book would I want to take on vacation? And that was kind of how I started the process of writing Bittersweet. Which is a perfect segue to what I want to ask you about next, which is, do you remember the day that you learned an editor wanted to publish Bittersweet? And if so, how would it, do you remember how you were feeling? And, and also, how quickly did you start thinking about, okay, promotion plans? Yeah, so, well, I wrote Bittersweet in a kind of a fever pitch, and it was actually kind of wonderful because I had a two and three year old at the time and I was just stealing time and I, and no one cared that I was writing it. Right. My agent was really supportive. We sent it out and we sent out that first round. They all said no, very nice nose, but nose. And then we made a second round. And I think maybe both of those rounds had like 10 people in them. I can't quite remember. And I think eight of the 10 people in the second round said no. And it was the ninth person who ended up becoming my beloved editor, Christine Koprash. And she said, I stayed up late, far past my bedtime reading this book. And then I dreamed about it. Um, (laughs) But I really don't like the ending. And I wonder if Miranda would consider taking a crack at rewriting the ending with a look towards X, Y, and Z. And I love my agent. (laughs) She drives me crazy because she does stuff like this. She called me. It was like Friday afternoon. And she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if that new ending was in her inbox on Monday morning? (laughs) (laughs) I had a three-year-old at the time, maybe a four-year-old at the time. Oh, my God. I guess that would be wonderful. You're talking to two writers who have both been writers with small children. <laughs> That's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. But I managed to do it. Oh, my wow. God. Wow. <laughs> it was a lot. And it was waiting in her inbox. And she was thrilled and shocked, which I think was a really good lesson for me. And like, if you have the opportunity to knock someone's socks off, you should go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Then what happened is she's very savvy because what she did is she basically in-house, before she bought it, she got the support of the foreign sales reps because the publisher bought world rights. I think that's something that a lot of non-publishing people don't know, which is how important how important the editor's role is beyond editing, that they, they are the internal champion. They are the people who sell your book to the people who are going to sell your book which is exactly what she did. I think it was about six weeks after I sold the book to Christine. I had earned back all my royalties from foreign sales. Wow. 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 Which really was amazing for the conversation inside the publishing house, because suddenly all of the higher ups who decide how much marketing and, you know, publicity dollars get spent on your book were going, Oh, well, okay, let's throw some more money at this book. I went in thinking they're going to do nothing for this book. And that's the way publishing works sometimes. And so I'm going to do whatever I can. And then I approached Dan and was like, hey, I'd really love to work with you to kind of like think about how we can build a plan that's my strategy in complement to the what they're doing. What I most remember is the blog that you did and the posts that sort of supported the blog on Dan's account and on your site, Miranda, you posted a tremendous amount about your feeling of failure, about the sales of your books in the past, your desire to do better with Bittersweet. You were very open about numbers. You were very open about need and vulnerability in terms of making this work for you as a career and how frightened you were really that it wouldn't. And you were very open as well about not just the psychology of the process, but also the logistics of it. And that was a year long blog, I think. I think it lasted an entire year. And As a reader, I felt very gripped by it. I want this person whom I've never laid eyes on, you know, I've never met uh, to succeed. I wanted as a writer to feel like if, oh, if I tried hard enough, I might be able to make it happen too. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Well, I'm wondering, A, did I get that right? And B, how much of those elements were you deliberately trying to infuse into what you did? 
My memory of it is that is correct and that it was all very intentional. Something I talk about a lot is the idea that you have to really begin thinking about marketing or book promotion at least a year ahead of launch. So that, that idea of spending a year on it was baked into that. Miranda ended up writing, I think, something like 120-something blog posts for that year. Wow. Wow. I do think you're right. I think that people get involved in a story. The idea was, yeah, let's be honest about everything. Let's put it all out there. And it kind of demystified the whole thing. Everything you just said sounds so amazing to me. The idea that um, you got to see that this was real work. You got to see how um, like emotional it was. To me, it feels like that was all intentional because really good marketing has to feel human as someone following someone on Instagram or showing up at a book reading or reading a blog like this, you have to feel invested on a human level. And Miranda did that just amazingly. Was that hard, Miranda? Was it hard to be that vulnerable and honest? And did you ever regret it? There were moments that were hard about the vulnerability. I mean, I think I felt a lot of shame about kind of like having messed up my early career. But one of the things that I really don't like about the publishing industry is just how little transparency there is about so much. Writers are desperate to just understand how it works because there is no one roadmap. And I think one of the greatest gifts that any of us who have gone through this process can have is basically to say, here, I'm going to tell you what I did. And it might not work for you, but maybe you'll get three ideas or maybe it'll boost your confidence or maybe it'll feel make you feel better about the fact that you tried it and it didn't work for you. One other thing that's a little counterintuitive is that I don't remember any of the content really being closely connected to the subject of bittersweet. You weren't reaching out and trying to find the perfect reader for this tale of friendship and class and you know and was that also deliberate? So I think sometimes as an author it is difficult to get a very, very clear sense of the reader. But you can look around and see all these other authors who are writing similar work, generally speaking, who are maybe in the same place that you are. And you say, well, if I don't quite know who the reader is going to be yet, you can look and say, well, who are the people that care about these kinds of stories, this kind of book that you would read? Who is really engaging in that? So I'm curious, in retrospect, now that you have a little distance on all of this, can you parse out how much a publisher's efforts and support matter to the sales and success of a book? Oh, an immense amount. I think that a book is made hugely successful by the support of a publishing house. And I think that starts from the moment that they make an offer on your book and the way that they're talking about your book and the way that they want to present your book to the world. And I don't say that to be disheartening, but I say that because I think it's a really important fact to know that publishing doesn't really always want you to know. I had an amazing young editor who was hungry to move up. And so she was able to put in those extra hours and that extra work and that extra advocacy that meant that what happened in house with the book change, that the story changed. But I will also say that my self-advocacy, my hiring Dan, and my saying I'm doing this work in the case of Bittersweet made a difference with the publisher saying, oh, Miranda is an asset to us. Because the truth is that publishers don't really know what works. I mean, this is the secret. They have a set of things they think usually work that make a book do well, but they don't always work. So the truth is that Having an author show up and say, hey, I'm here to work and I have some ideas about how I'm going to do that. But like, what are your ideas? Makes a huge difference in the conversation. How has the success of the promotion of Bittersweet, both the publishers and yours and Dan's, affected you in the years that have come since? That's a great question. It can be easy to lose sight of how lucky I am to have this job and to be continuing to do it because I'm always hungry for more. <laughs> and also because the hustle is hard. June didn't sell as well as Bittersweet. And Crown didn't want the book that I was hoping to write after June. So it's not like I had a New York Times bestseller and suddenly everything turned to gold around me. 
but I, am I still doing this job? Yes, I am. I have really awesome opportunities come from it. They totally have. Do I still have goals beyond just writing another New York Times bestseller? I do. <laughs> but I also feel really lucky that I got to do this work and excited to do it again and also really scared to do it again. That's the thing about this process is that writing a book is really hard and scary. And then promoting a book is really hard and scary. I just think that's something I'm never going to get over. I'm not sure it's something I'm ever going to get over either. In a weird way, I almost feel like every book I write is harder than the one before. Maybe because I know more about what I'm doing and so I know more about what it's going to take to get a book to be what it needs to be. But it never seems easier. No, it's always harder. In part two, because... I at least always want to do something a little different and, you know, not repeat the same formula. One thing I realized talking to Miranda, too, is the promoting part. Also, you start back, I feel like, at ground zero. You can't yeah. promote any book the same way. You have to crack the code for that again as well. Right, because each book is different and each moment is different. So in the however many years between books the way books get promoted, the things that work will change. Yeah. So what are the lessons that we take away, do you think, from Miranda's experience? Look, I think it's really clear that the publisher matters a lot to the success of the book. And I think having an editor who's an internal champion of your book makes a huge difference. The story that Miranda tells about how her editor had already sold a whole bunch of foreign rights so that her advance was paid back six days after <laughs> they offered her the contract. That starts momentum in a publishing house that's very hard to replicate as an author. Yeah, it's incredible. But I think to making sure that your publisher knows that you are doing everything that you possibly can to market the book, having ideas of your own, showing some kind of both commitment and expertise in terms of the quality of the ideas that you have. I think that is hugely helpful. As you and I often say, you can't ever know whether something you're doing to try to market your book will help, but doing nothing will certainly not help. Yes. So. <laughs> That's my mantra. Yeah. So wouldn't it be great if there were just a magic machine that could take our manuscripts and turn them into bestsellers? Sort of like, did you ever have one of those rock polishing machines when you were a kid and you take the ugly, dusty, yucky rocks and you put them in the machine and it makes a lot of noise for, I don't know, half an hour. And then you get these polished, gorgeous stones. Remember those? We didn't have those in Baton Rouge. Are you serious? One. Oh my gosh. Well, we, we probably did. We didn't have them in my address in Baton Rouge. Oh, well, I had one in New Jersey and I loved it. <laughs> and now I would like one for my books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. Luckily. Yes, I was going to say, luckily, we spoke to someone who can help with this. Um, Matthew Jockers is Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of English and Data Analytics at Washington State University. He uses computers, natural language processing, and machine learning to extract information about cultural trends from large collections of texts. He's written a number of books, including, most relevant here, The Bestseller Code, Anatomy of the Blockbuster Novel, which he wrote with Jody Archer. They are both the inventors of the bestsellerometer. He's a co-founder of Authors AI, a text mining company that helps authors develop more successful novels through data analytics. So we started by asking Matt, what kinds of information can a computer glean from a novel? We had about 3,500, close to 4,000, I think, that we studied for the bestseller code. We knew that those books were of two types. They were either bestsellers or not bestsellers. And so after you extract all of this information, you can use other computational techniques, classifiers and clustering algorithms to extract what features are different in the non-bestsellers from the bestsellers. And then you can begin to build predictive models that sort of look at those differences and make sense out of them. So once you'd done that, you developed an algorithm, which is what we call the bestseller code, right? <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah. call it the bestsellerometer. Bestsellerometer. Uh, I like that. That feels sort of friendly and <laughs> understandable. <laughs> okay. Much better than algorithm. 
And then how did you test its effectiveness? So we'll run a test like this. We'll say, all right, let's pull out 300 of the books that we know are bestsellers and 300 that we know are not bestsellers. And we'll have the machine build a model based on those. And now we'll test the model on the books that we didn't show the machine to begin with. And then we can benchmark how well the machine does at classifying those unseen books. And that's how we eventually arrived at that number that some that varies between 80 and 83 percent accuracy in correctly identifying a bestseller or a non-bestseller. What were the definitions, I guess, without getting too specific, for a bestseller? For this work, we really just looked at the New York Times hardcover adult fiction list from about 1980 to whenever it was at that time that we were working on the project. And we set the additional criteria that the book had to hit the list and stay there for 10 weeks. Mm. We wanted to control for the sort of one hit, one week wonders and really try and identify the books that had staying power. And in the end, we had 513 books that met that criteria of bestseller. Got it. And how did you choose the sample of non-bestsellers? Well, that was the trickier part. And we tried to collect a range of books. Some of those books were, by all means, what you would consider to be successful books. They just weren't books that hit the list for 10 weeks. And then there were books in there that, you know, maybe sold two or three copies. And we tried to create a sample that was sort of representative of what you'd see if you walked into a bookstore. So what did you learn? What does the code teach us generally about bestsellers? Well, we learned a lot of stuff. One of the things we we discovered around characters is that characters who get described as having clear wants and needs tend to be more successful. In other words, we find more characters like that on the bestseller list. And this is as opposed to a character's wishes and hopes, which tend to be more common in books that don't hit the list. Another thing, just because this one's easy to understand, we found that the books that really do well on the bestseller list have a limited range of subjects. So one of the things the tool can track is sort of how many topics a writer is trying to embrace at one time. And the books that do very well in the popular kind of fiction market have three or four topics that dominate the content of the book. And there was something in the book as well about patterns of emotions. The best example of this is The Da Vinci Code. And if you've read that book, you know that Dan Brown ends every chapter very predictably with a kind of emotional cliffhanger. Something is happening. And then he stops that action, moves to a new chapter, and doesn't return to that for a little while. And these are the books that people describe as page turners. Fifty Shades of Grey is another one of these. The larger kind of archetypal shape of the narrative could be something different. It's this rhythmic beats that seems to be the important element for really hitting the charts. That was one of the more surprising parts of the book for me, um, learning that Fifty Shades of Grey and The Da Vinci Code had the same emotional map structure, because I I would not have put those two books in the same bucket, (laughs) apart from their sales. (laughs) Um, so until very recently, you ran a consulting company using this the um, bestsellerometer. Authors would send you novels they were working on, and you would run it through the algorithm and then advise them on what kind of changes might increase their odds of creating a bestseller. What were the most common mistakes, or maybe not mistakes, but what were the most common things that you found authors needed to change if they wanted to follow the code? An important thing to get out is that there isn't a single formula for best-selling. If there was, we'd all be writing the Da Vinci Code over and over again, and it wouldn't be a very interesting world. So this is the thing that we would try to help people figure out is their specific balance and what features were out of balance relative to the others. A simple example would be the balance between narrative and dialogue. So we could highlight, for example, places where the narrative was getting too heavy and really needed some interjection of dialogue in order to break that narrative monotony. Mm -hmm. 
we would work with them a lot on the emotional beats of the narrative. We could identify pretty quickly areas where things were sort of stagnant and they needed to introduce some kind of action or some kind of conflict to keep the pages turning. We could also help them to see the personalities of their characters and how those characters were being developed and how they'd be perceived based on the language and particularly the ways those characters were acting, the verbs that they were enacting. We have a very exciting, cool bit of news to report. Matt has launched a company called Authors AI. So essentially, the bestsellerometer is online, and you can put your manuscript in it and find out in minutes what you need to do to dominate the New York Times list. Yeah. Yes, it's so, so cool. And essentially, the report will tell you things like, how is the pacing of your novel? Are you over relying on certain words? Is there a lot of repetition? Do you have enough verbs to suggest that the book is full enough of action? How are the proportions between narrative and dialogue? And this is just in a matter of minutes. It does seem pretty cool. So basically, it's evaluating your manuscript according to all the criteria that Matthew's research has demonstrated go into best-selling novels. Exactly. Now, of course, it's not perfect. And so the next thing we did was we talked to Matthew about the limitations of the bestsellerometer. Is it safe to say that a manuscript needs to get a high score from the model in order to have a good chance of being a bestseller? But having a high score is no guarantee of being a bestseller. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So there are lots of books out there who that might get a that would get a good score, but that are not, in fact, bestsellers. Sure. And so this gets to the point that there's more to getting a bestseller than just writing the book. Yeah, right. And the other thing I, I think it's important to point out is that it's easy to think, oh, 82 percent accuracy. That sounds pretty good until you then look at the 18 percent that are failures. Right. Our model consistently said that Game of Thrones was not bestseller material. But tell that to um, Martin. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, anytime anyone says, you know, 70 percent chance likelihood now, I just think Hillary Clinton, you know, and I. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's not perfect. But even with Game of Thrones, for example, it's still interesting to look at what the model thinks. What were the reasons for its decision that that wasn't a bestseller? And in that case, it's largely that that kind of material doesn't tend to appear on the bestseller list. Mm. Hmm. Is there something circular about saying, here are the elements of a bestseller, and therefore, if it's a bestseller, it's going to have those elements? I think I can clarify that. So it is definitely the case that the model is trained on the data you give it. And so the model wants to find things that are like bestsellers that it knows. So this is why Game of Thrones gets a poor score in the bestsellerometer because it's atypical of what you see on the bestseller list. So the, the worst thing you can say is that we've built a model that's good at predicting what's happened in the past, but isn't very good at predicting the future because we can't train it on unseen on material that hasn't come out yet. There's some truth to that. But the other thing that Jody and I found is that there are consistent patterns at a deeper level that are consistent across that 30 or so year period that we studied. So there are sort of some base elements that kind of have to be there, the trunk of the tree, if you will. Julie and I are going to try to find an author friend who writes books for grown-ups who's game to try the bestsellerometer. And then we will report back in a future episode about what the bestsellerometer had to say. I can't wait. Yay. Yay. In the meantime, I think that's it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. 
We're also on Twitter at Book Dreams Pod and on Instagram at Book Dreams Podcast. Many thanks to our associate producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eveyohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love and listen to Book Dreams with Julie.